Amen. Let's, let's give a hand for Caleb and Bennett. That's awesome. You know, as they were talking, uh, the thought crossed my mind. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in all the great revivals or mighty moves of God throughout history, normally God does it through his youth, okay? He rises up a next generation. If you haven't been like seeing what's happening in Lebanon, uh, you need to open your eyes and see that a next generation is rising up with a hunger and passion for God. Even this last week, um, I watched as they had prayer meetings. I watched as they circled the school, praying for the school. So um, adults, um, for some of us, it's time we get on board with how God is waking up this next generation. Amen. So if you have your Bible, why don't you take it out and meet me in Matthew chapter 7. And we are going to say, God, open up your word, open up our hearts, for we are listening. Matthew chapter 7. If you've been with us this summer, we have been looking at the greatest sermon of all time from the greatest preacher of all time. Okay, we've been looking at the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and it's been special, hasn't it? Like, it's, it's been amazing to be walking through the message of Jesus. And, and what has been so special about it? What's been so amazing about it? Let me just make a few comments about where we've been all summer. First of all, I think that there is just this beauty and this power of the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Um, even yesterday, I was, I was building a bonfire. And as this fire was growing and growing, I was both drawn to its beauty and its power. Like, like it's beautiful. It, it mesmerized me. But as I got a little closer, it was like singeing my eyebrows and burning my skin. And I was like, there's beauty and there's power. It's awesome and it changes you. And I think this sermon is like that. It like draws you in, but it leaves you changed. Okay? So there's power in this message. Um, I think also... Um, I would say this about Jesus, and I can't say this about myself, okay? This is the only preacher who ever 100% lived every bit of the words that he spoke. Like, if you know me well, and, and this church knows me well, like, there's sometimes a hypocrisy between what I preach and how I live. Jesus is the only one who you could ever say he practiced what he preached and his life was just filled with the power of his words, okay? And then, uh, finally, let me just give you one final thing, um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna launch into his great ending. Jesus always was walking around and giving the message and basically saying, the kingdom of God is here. I brought this brand new reality. I'm the king, I brought my kingdom, and I want you to live life in my kingdom. And the question that everybody asks, and I assume you ask, is, okay, that's awesome. Like, how do we do that? Like, how do I live life in the kingdom of God? And the Sermon on the Mount is the great how. Okay, it's how to live life in the kingdom, following him as king. If you've ever asked the question, I hope you've asked the question, how do I live like you want me to live, Jesus? This is his great like thesis of how to live life in the kingdom of God. And this morning, he is going to end his sermon. And it's not going to be with a cute little poem. It's not going to be with like this alliterated, awesome little quote. He's not even going to close in prayer. Okay, he is going to close this sermon with a beautiful, terrifying parable, and it's just going to hang in the air and confront us with our life. It will be mesmerizing with beauty. It will be powerful. Okay, he's going to close with a little parable, and um, it's going to be awesome. Okay, but as we get into this parable, it's helpful just to remember just a little bit of where we've been. So I just want to briefly review. Okay, I'm not going to review everything. That would be too long. But, but just let me br review just a little bit about life in the kingdom. Okay, so flip back just a couple pages. All right. Matthew chapter 6, he starts out with kingdom character. Okay? Remember, he starts out by saying, here's how I'm going to start my sermon. Blessed or flourishing are you if, and then remember how he starts? He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
meaning you're blessed or you will live this flourishing, thriving life. Not, look at me, not if you say, hey God, here's my spiritual resume. Here's how holy I am. Here's all the Bible knowledge I have. I'm a pretty good person, aren't I, God? He's like, no, you will live a flourishing life if you can start out saying, God, I come before you empty, poor, with great big deficits, and I need you, God. And God's like, you start like that, and that's the kind of life I'm looking for, and I will cause you to flourish. He starts with kingdom character, and he goes on from there. Um, he moves on to kingdom influence, and he basically looks his people in the eyes and says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I want you to live life like salt, influencing this culture. I want you to, to preserve this decaying world. I want you to bring out the flavors of God. Um, you are light. I, I don't want you to hide it under a bushel. No. I want you to shine, right? I want you to be... Uh, Jensen, can I get an amen? I want you to be salty and lit, okay? I want you, thank you, Jensen. I want you to live with a kingdom kind of influence. And he moves on. Keep looking in the Sermon on the Mount. He moves on to a kingdom trust. Remember, he said some kind of confronting words. He said, I don't want you to worry about what you will eat or about what you will wear, about what you will drink. He's like, look at the birds, look at the grass. You're way more important than that. I love you and I have you. Therefore, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I've got everything else. He wants us to live life with a kingdom kind of trust. Let me give you one more. He wants us to live life with a kingdom view of judgment. Okay? He wants you to say, remember what Jesus said? He said, don't judge others. I think Jesus would look at you and me and a lot of evangelical Christianity and say, I can acknowledge and agree that there's a speck in your brother's eye or your sister's eye or that church's eye. However, it's just amazing that you can see it with that big old log hanging off of your head because like, don't judge others lest you be judged, okay? And Jesus over and over and over again tells us this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And then he's going to close it, okay? And he's going to close it today with Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, okay? And we're going to look at a famous little paragraph, beautiful and terrifying. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Let me read it to us. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Can I pray for us, and then we'll dive in. Lord, we just love you. We need you. I pray that these words of yours would be life and hope and peace and joy and instruction to our very souls. Spirit of the living God, we know that you're here. Would you do what only you can do and take over now and illuminate this text and shine through my words so that we, that we would leave here as people who've heard from you and obey. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, as I was reading that text, um, if you kind of grew up in church world, you may have been singing a little song in your head, or you may have had, this will date some of you, you may have had flannel graphs in your mind, or, or veggie tales for some of you. Wise man who built his house on the rock, foolish man built his house on the sand. You know the story? Um, and you would see on that flannel board, or you would see in your veggie tale, or you would see in whatever it is you picture, some things that are pretty similar, okay? You have two similar builders, similar building projects, similar looking homes, similar storm, right? 
and there's one great difference. And so, by the way, whenever you look at a parable of Jesus, sort of the interpretive lens or kind of how you approach it is to say what in this like parable is similar and what is the one thing that changes? Because the one thing that changes is the heart of Jesus' teaching. So again, like look at this with me. I already said it, but let's just say it again. What's similar and then one's the great, what is the great thing that changes? Okay, similar builders, similar project, similar home. This is going to be so important for later. You're going to look at this and say, on the surface, th th those homes look the same. And similar storm. And there's one great difference. Okay, look at the text. What's the one great difference? All right, you dig below the surface and you'd see that the one great difference is the foundation, right? The foundation. Has anybody in here ever built a home? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, if you know um, Newman family closely, we're in the middle of building a home and, um, and we're at the process right now where we're just about to lay a foundation. And I've kind of always known that, that a foundation is important. You've probably heard me preach this like 48 times, you know, throughout Antioch's history, like the importance of our foundation. But I actually have never really truly understood the importance of a foundation. Okay? Like our builder has looked me in the eyes and said, when it comes to the foundation, we have to get this right. We absolutely have to get this right. I didn't realize that, that there were like building plans and there were foundation plans. Did you guys know that? Like I kind of thought, I don't know why, but I kind of thought foundation is you just sort of like dig a hole and back up cement truck and kind of like fill it in there and then you got your foundation. We're good to start building finally, right? But a foundation is essential. Let me tell you a little bit about a foundation from what I've learned, okay? First of all, a foundation holds the weight of the, they call it dead load and live load. Dead load, all the wood, all the like stones, all the bricks, all the, all the house, and live load meaning all the people, okay? You have to have a solid foundation to hold both the materials and the people. Second thing, okay? You have to have a solid foundation, this is so important for theology, okay? to prevent from mold and decay and, and sort of moisture coming in. It provides this barrier from mold and words like rot abatement and, you know, words like that, okay? And then third and finally, and so important for this text, okay? It protects from external force like wind and waves and water and storm, okay? That's why you need a foundation. And Jesus is going to say, hey, after you've heard my sermon, after you've heard all these words, there is something that will be a critical differentiator on your foundation, and it will mean everything, okay? And so I don't, I don't want us to miss this. It's going to be just so important to everything that we've heard. One built his house on the rock, one built his house on the sand. Jesus looked at the one that built it on the rock and used the Greek word, let me just tell it to you, phronimos, which means wise. He used the one that built it on the sand and used the word moros, which is where we actually get the word moron. All right? And I don't mean to be like, like crass or trite with this, but Jesus was basically saying, you've listened to my sermon, you've listened to my words, now I want you to build wisely do not be a moron. End of sermon. That's how this text ends. Okay? And so, like, I don't want us to be a moron church. And so we are going to look at three great questions in this text. If you're taking notes, there's three great questions. It has everything to do with wisdom. Okay? Here's the first one. How do we live with kingdom wisdom? How do we build wisely with our life on the rock? How do we build with kingdom wisdom? Second question. What will reveal kingdom wisdom? Okay, how do, how do we know if we're living wise or if we're living foolishly? And then third, what is the source of kingdom wisdom? Anybody with me? 
How do we know if we're living in kingdom wisdom? What reveals if we're living in kingdom wisdom? And what's the source of kingdom wisdom? Okay, so let's look at the main point right away. Look at verse 24. Okay, what's the differentiator? What equals wisdom? This is so important. We're going to look at 24 and 26. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Look at 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Okay, do you hear the difference? This is where it's kind of terrifying, ready? Wisdom is not found just in hearing the words of Jesus or being inspired by the words of Jesus, or understanding the words of Jesus, or being emotionally moved by the words of Jesus. Wisdom is found in hearing, understanding, being uplifted, and doing what you heard. Wisdom is found in saying, God, what are you saying, and what do you want me to do about it, and actually responding and obeying. Okay, Moses once gave this amazing sermon when the people were about to enter the promised land, okay? And he, and, and you might know if you studied the Sermon on the Mount, that there's parallels between Moses speaking to the people and Jesus speaking to the people. And I just want you to hear this one phrase in Deuteronomy 32. You can turn there. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. But let me just read this to you. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to all of Israel, verse 46, watch this. He said to them, Take to heart all the words by which I'm warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. Now listen to this. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word you shall live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. Okay, Moses was saying, there's a way that you can live where you hear and it's actually empty. Or there's a way that you can live where it will be your very life. Can I say that again? Don't let that go too quick over you. You can live an empty life. You can live life like God intended you to live, okay? And um, the question is, how do the very words of God become the foundation of your life? It's in hearing and obeying. It's in simple obedience. It's in saying, and we're going to ask this later, God, what are you saying and what do you want me to do about it? Okay, so in the modern West, okay, in recent times in Western culture, here's how we often equate wisdom, okay? Wisdom often, what we think, okay, comes in understanding. Like it's, when you understand and when you can communicate what you understand and when you maybe even so understand and can communicate to what you understand that you can call out people on social media or wherever else that don't fully understand what you understand. They're off in your understanding. That's what equals wisdom, right? That's not what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say that wisdom is tethered to understanding. He says wisdom is tethered to simple obedience, to those who will listen and do, hear the voice of God and respond. Say, God, what are you saying? Okay, I want to follow it. Is it possible? Please look me in the eyes and don't miss this. Is it possible to be a Christian for a very long time and to grow in your Bible knowledge, and to hear what God is saying, and to grow in your journals that you're filling up, and to take Bible study after Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, and still be biblically a moron? Is it possible to be in church for decades and decades, and knowing, 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 growing in your like modern understanding, and yet be building life on the sand? Jesus says, yes, it is. Because it's possible to hear his words and then let it be empty and just miss what he's saying. Let me give you some examples. Um, Jesus said in the sermon, Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called the sons of God. So you take that. So kingdom wisdom is not saying, okay, what is peace? Okay, peace is the, the Hebrew word shalom. It's the Greek word irene. And that's so awesome to think about peace. And, and God helps us find peace with him. And we can have peace with others. Wisdom is not just knowing that. Okay? Wisdom actually comes when you're saying, hey, somebody disagrees with me? Like maybe instead of raising conflict there and getting feisty, and fe- maybe wisdom is found in saying, how will I make peace? How will I be a peacemaker? Because that's what the sons of God look like. Uh, it says in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I tell you a woman that a man who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery in his heart. And so you remember what Jesus said? Jesus is like, do something drastic if you have to. And he uses this um, like hyperbolic uh, language. Is like, if you need to like, you know, take out your eye, do, do drastic things. Wisdom is not just in knowing that. It's saying, all right, God, what would you have me do? Do I need to delete my Instagram account? Do I need to uh, cancel Netflix? Like, what is drastic in this day and age? I don't know. Jesus is like, wisdom is when you hear and you obey. Okay? Um, James says it like this. Faith without works is dead. Jesus says in another place, John 14, listen to the words of Jesus. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Okay, so let me just summarize this first point. All right? Because again, it's kind of a like, it, it, it's kind of a turnaround from how we think about wisdom. Jesus is like, how are you building on the rock, not the sand? How are you living wise, not foolish? How are you living a full life, not empty? It's not just in knowing and hearing. It's in saying, God, what are you saying? Because I want to respond and I want to obey. It's in simple obedience. Everybody understand that? Okay, second point. What reveals kingdom wisdom? Did you catch it from the parable? Wisdom is revealed in a storm. Let me say that again. Our foundations will be revealed often in storms. And if you look back at the text, it says, The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house. It didn't say if a storm comes. Implication, when storms come. And in this text, you need to know uh, that... Bible scholars would say, first of all, the storm is pointing to the ultimate, big, final storm of all storms, meaning one day Jesus is coming again and there will be a great judgment and our lives will be sifted and everything that stood for eternity on the rock will stand and everything that was like temporal will fade away. Okay? It's pointing to that. But it's also just pointing to like the storms of life like the trials and hardships and frustrations of of life. Jesus is saying in the midst of storms, God will actually use storms to reveal weaknesses in your foundation. He will use storms to show you what your life is being built upon. Okay, so let me just give you some examples from what we've heard this summer. Uh, We heard, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or your heart will chase your treasure. Okay, so let's just walk through this parable. Jesus is like, the wise person says, all right, you're saying that, God? Okay, let me, let me look at my life. Let me look at my, my treasure, my money, my stuff, my possessions. I, I'm not going to store them up. I'm not going to wrap my life around those, but I'm going to invest in eternity. Let me assess my life and say, am I funding that which is eternal? Am I storing up my, my possessions for eternity, not for this earth? And my heart will chase my treasure. Will I hear and will I do it? 
And he's also saying, hey, you want to know if you, look at the storm comes. Like, like if your car gets wrecked or, or if there's a dip in the economy and you lose some in your 401k or if you like, like if something happens and your possessions go down a little bit, will your life be wrecked? A storm will reveal your foundation. A storm will reveal like, like if you're building it on the eternal or not, okay? Or let me point to another one. I struggle with this one all the time. Let me just be very real with you. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, but seek first the kingdom, okay? Do not be anxious. If you want to know, like, the Greek word for anxiety and a biblical, like, theological understanding of anxiety, I can ninja that one out, okay? Like, I can tell you everything you need to know. And my kind of self-assessment, self-perception of myself is that, like, I'm not anxious. Like, I... I have, I'm full of faith, like, like I'm bold in my trust for the Lord. But do you want to know what often reveals my anxiety? When I'm going through a storm. And God, like gracefully, and I don't even know how to perfectly theologically explain this, but part of God's ultimate, like, godness over storms that happen in my life is to lovingly say, David, like, I want to reveal to you little areas where you're still building on sand. And I want to retrain your trust to be on me, okay? And so let me just pause. It would, it would almost be foolish not to, not to go here, and yet I want to be careful as I go here, okay? So as I say this next illustration, I, boldly I want you not to think about other people, but I think God would have us think about our hearts, okay? Just ourselves, okay? Promise me. This is not a judgment moment. I've got another point in the Sermon on the Mount if you're going to to judge, okay? This last year, we obviously went through a global storm, okay? Like, Like this pandemic was a global storm. And I think one of the things the Lord wants to do in each of our hearts is to say, hey, is there any area of your life that I want to reveal like, for example, like, like I've just preached throughout this. Like Jesus said, do not judge others. Do not, or pray for those who persecute you. Or love your enemies or those who disagree with you. So my question for you, again, for you, not to point to others, for you is to say, has God kind of graciously revealed in the course of this last year that there might be more judgment in your heart towards others? Has he revealed that? Or, or do not be anxious. Do not worry about the future. Has God revealed some of your foundation in this last global storm? And is he saying, actually, I want you to repent and, and to realize that there are parts of your heart that have been anxious, have been worried, have been building on the sand, and I want to lovingly draw you back to building on the foundation of trusting in me. I, I would tell you, don't waste the storm. Like, Like, don't waste what God wants to do in your heart in the middle of this COVID pandemic, okay? The storm reveals your foundation. And finally, and I just have one more question. Um, What is the source of kingdom wisdom or or living, building on the foundation? Because if I just kind of stop this message here, truthfully, I think it would sound like, like, You need to hear, you need to obey. You need to get your life on track. You need to, you know, get after it and obey what you know. And maybe even on your own strength, and that's not the heart of Jesus at all. So I want to lift this to one of the most beautiful, hope-filled truths of Jesus because this is what he intends and this is what he has for you, and I just love this, okay? Part of the reason that he's the greatest preacher that ever was is he is the only preacher that ever lived that says, I'm calling you to do this and I'm not leaving you to do it on your own power. In fact, I will be with you. I will indwell you. I will empower you and I will walk with you, giving you a source of strength to do what you could never do on your own. You're not alone in the storm. You're not alone to live an obedient life until one day you meet God. He's like, well, let me just read it to you. 
This is John, uh, John 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then watch this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay. So I'm almost done, but I just want you, I just want you to hear this. Jesus, even earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Jesus is saying, I'm not leaving you as an orphan. I want you to live a life where you're continually saying, God, I want to hear your voice and do what you've called me to do with a Savior empowering you with strength that you do not have on your own. Okay. And so, as we approach God's word, um, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to God's word and to say, Spirit of God, would you illuminate this text? And I'm going to ask you the question daily, what are you saying and what do you want me to do about it? As you feel little twinges of conviction when you're sinful and off, which I do every single day, okay? When the Spirit of God just pricks your spirit that, that you're out of alignment with his will, I want you to ask the question, God, what are you saying and what do you want me to do about it? As you're seeking the Lord in prayer, which I hope you do, as you're going to him and talking to the Lord, I want you to be asking the question, what are you saying and what do you want me to do about it? And then, follower of Jesus, we can have the beautiful, incredible spirit of the living God within us to empower us to hear his voice and to obey his will. Look at me. Jesus closes the sermon in a beautiful, terrible way, terrifying way, okay? He's like, basically, you heard everything I said? You hear all this teaching? All right. There's a wise man and there's a moron, all right? Wise man hears these words, builds his life on the foundation. Foolish man hears these words, inspired by these words, moved by these words, and then doesn't do it. Jesus says, if you do that, if you live like that, if you live with your knowledge growing, but your obedience fading, you're building life on the sand, and one day there will be a fall, and great is that fall. So Antioch, I love you, and Jesus loves you, okay? He's inviting you in. He's inviting you to say, are there any areas of your life where the foundation is a little bit weak? I love you enough to, to want to point those out and to build those up in you. Like, I love you. Come, come in. Let me, let me build your foundation. Walk with me and build on me. And as we enter this time of communion, okay, which is what we're going to do right now, I want you to dwell with the Lord a little bit. And I want you to say, God, is there anything, anything where there's cracks in my foundation, fault lines in my foundation? where I've heard from you and I haven't responded, okay? And if so, I just want you to spend some time repenting before the Lord and calling on his grace and mercy because it's there um, and then knowing he'll meet you in that, okay? On the night before Jesus was crucified, he took bread and he took wine. He broke it and he poured it. And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. This is my blood. It's poured out for you. When you take these symbols, do them in remembrance of me. So spend some time with the Lord, okay? Repent over anything that you need to. Seek his face. Celebrate his goodness. And when the moment's right, let's stand and let's sing and worship to the Lord. Uh, can, I just, can I just pray for us? Lord, we love you. And we want to be people and we want to be a church that, that is building on rock, not sand. 
And so I pray for my own heart and for everybody here that we would hear from you and respond. So would you even meet us in these moments, God? Meet us as followers of Jesus who are seeking to commune with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to take communion if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, don't, don't like take this as like some kind of church ritual, okay? What we want to do is we'd actually love to meet with you after the service and tell you how you can know Christ as your Savior. Um, in these moments, take communion, and then we'll stand and sing together.